All right. Good morning. I know it's early. So just sort of as a review of where we are, I am going to have the third exam with the essay um, done by Tuesday. You'll have all of next week to do that. It'll be due a week from Tuesday. So we won't meet in class, so you don't have to get up and come really early. Um, I hope that you enjoy the time off uh, and use the class period to work on the essay or you know, sleep down and then work on it later or whatever. Uh, we were talking about pricing objectives and particularly about how sort of American companies in many instances choose short term over long term. And I told you that in Japan, one of the things that's different is that banks, for example, are willing to learn to loan on long term uh, basis based on your company's ability to sort of survive and grow over the long term, whereas American companies have a tendency to focus on uh, quarter over quarter or short, short term goals, uh, increasing sales, um, things like that. Uh, and you can also try to grow your market share. McDonald's is a, an example of this. They have a huge market share in the fast food industry, right? I mean, they've got like the, the plurality of of the market in that, but they started losing out to Starbucks in one of their most profitable segments of that fast food market, which was breakfast. And so they have started to sort of try and rebrand. So this is an example again of how all of this stuff sort of integrates. They've tried to rebrand themselves. If you if you look at McDonald's of the past, you know, they were this sort of low slung building with this faux pitched roof and a uh, playground, because that's who went to McDonald's, right? It was was people with kids and people were in a hurry. They had a playground and um, they've started to rebrand themselves or attempt to rebrand themselves or reposition themselves in the market. And so they're starting to look more like, if you look at McDonald's, they look more like a Starbucks. They've got this McCafe option and they're trying to increase, basically regain their market share of that breakfast, uh, of that breakfast market, um, some companies are just into uh, survival mode, and then of course we talked about social responsibility. Tom's one for one, Bombus one for one. These these corporations that try to have other goals in their pricing um, in terms of social responsibility. So pricing constraints, consumer demand is obviously a huge constraint. Your uh, your costs are constrained. And I wonder why is that going out? Hmm. Okay. Let me switch to that one. And then that. And then see if I can get it. Technology is wonderful until it doesn't work. All right. Old fashioned. So we draw or we think of supply and demand in terms of these sort of, you know, demand, supply and demand curves. And we think of them as being linear. Um, they're not always. There are instances where um, it's not necessarily a linear relationship, but we have a tendency to think of them so uh, as, as linear um, relationships. So as price increases, 
um, quantity uh, demand decreases, right? So it's an inverse, the demand curve is what we call an inverse curve. The supply curve is a positive curve. The higher the price um, that we can charge, the more units we're going to be able to put out in, in theory, right? I mean, um, all other things being equal and everything being held constant. You can have shifts in these curves. Where the two curves meet, that's called the equilibrium point, and economists are fascinated by the equilibrium point. But since we're talking about price, we're going to focus on the demand curve, which is a pricing constraint. You can have shifts in the curve either to the left or to the right. So if you have a shift in the curve to the right, which is that direction, what do you have? And you have to remember, so one of the first offices I had on campus, they moved my office. I was the assistant equity officer, and I was under the office of legal counsel. And they thought that we were in the administration building, and they thought that um, people wouldn't come see us if we were in the administration building. So they moved us into Thatcher Hall. And my office was in the actual economics hallway. There's uh, one office that was, was controlled by the administration division. And so I was in the economics hallway, and I was right across from a professor who taught um, both macro, micro, and intro to economics. And I can remember every semester her lecturing students, they would come in, they hadn't done well in the first exam, and she'd have to say, you have to remember that supply is the whole curve, and demand is the whole curve. So when you think about this, it's not just movement along the curve, right? It's also a shift in the curve, which is the whole curve. So what would cause recently, in recent times, when you think of something that would cause demand to shift to the right? So what happens if demand shifts to the right? So think about this. This is price, this is quantity. What happens if demand shifts to the right, if you have an entire shift in the demand curve, what's going on there? At every point along the curve. That's a, that's a movement along the curve. At every point along the curve, what's happening? It's all changing. Okay, it's all changing in which direction? Look at, so let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say that's hundreds of units or thousands of units. And this is dollars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's happened if you have a shift to the right? Will your quantity increase? That's a movement along the curve. So demand increases? Do you have a, yes, demand increases if you have a shift to the right, which means that at every point along the curve, what's going on? At every single point along the curve. Okay, demand is increasing, but at every single, in terms of price, what's happening along the curve? At, at every single point along the curve, people are willing to pay a higher price. There's been an entire shift to the right. If you had a shift that way, right, to the left, there would be less quantity demanded at every single price along the curve, right? So you've got increased at every single point along the curve, people are willing to pay more. Right? So here, they were willing to pay two dollars, you know, this is for two, at 200, right? Um, now, to the right, they're willing to pay more. Did I get that right? At every point along the curve. Here, at two, you only have 100 demanded, right? At $2, at this point along the curve, you have 100 quantity demanded. 
at two dollars you have 200 so there's an increase in demand along the curve at every single price point along the curve if you went here right at this point along the curve if the curve is here they're willing to pay about 150 and you're going to sell you know uh at three dollars you're i'm sorry at three dollars you're going to sell about 150 but at three dollars along this point at the curve you're going to sell what 200. what can cause a shift in the right of the demand curve that's happened recently for example or you could even think about it as a shift to the left where less quantity is demanded at every price along the curve. So like, you could make the argument like mass, like at the beginning of the pandemic, it's really hard to get a hold of. Oh, okay. And then like now they're right. readily available. So at the at the beginning of the pandemic, the only people that were wearing these things, these masks, were primarily what? Healthcare, healthcare workers. Primarily, it was primarily, and it wasn't just healthcare workers. It was primarily healthcare workers that were working in surgery, right? That's where we think of people wearing masks. If you go back and you look at old television shows, all of a sudden, there's this increase in awareness of transmission of diseases that may kill you. And so all of a sudden, people start demanding and start buying masks. The, other, the same thing happened with um, I am addicted to these kinds of wipes. I, I mean, I love the Clorox ones because they're bigger than these, but I'm addicted to them. I wipe down all the surfaces of my house constantly. I, I, we own a bed and breakfast, so there's lots of people in and out, right? And I'm sort of a hypochondriac, so I was, you know, and all of a sudden, the demand at every point along the curve had increased for these people were willing to pay more at every point along the curve because there's this pandemic demand for a lot of stuff shifted to the right as a result of COVID people were, were looking for things to do so I had two boats I had a 36 foot sailboat and a 36 foot cruiser which had two engines the average age of the first time boat owner before covid was over 55. covid strikes and the average age of the first time boat owner drops to 42. and demand for boats increased. Why is that during COVID? Let's say I forgot to give you a time. Because people have more time? Yeah, all of a sudden, people are working from home, right? I mean, all of a sudden, people are working from home and they're looking for things and they're, and they're stuck. My brother experiences, I don't have kids. Kids make me nervous. I never wanted to have children, so I don't have them. But my brother has kids. My ex-wife also said she didn't want to have kids. And then she went and had five, so apparently she just didn't want to have kids with me, right? Um, but I don't want to have kids. But my brother has kids, and all of a sudden you're stuck at home with kids, and you're looking for things to do. And what can you? what's one of the things that was safe very well? Like, Get out on a lake. You, this is an activity that you can do that's, that's socially distanced. And so the demand increased. So there was a shift to the right, and younger people were buying boats. It was primarily older. I mean, like, before COVID, like, my, my brother's kids, they're, they're kind of interested in boats. My nephew's really, he likes, he, he is, he's, um, He's 11 and his sister's 10 and he loves anything mechanical. He is really good at driving the boat, both boats. He could, he could do both boats. Now I have an airplane and he 
wants to take lessons to learn to fly. But he's kind of an unusual kid. Most kids of his generation are addicted to this thing or, or that thing that they play games on. And so people weren't buying boats before COVID except older people who had this sort of nostalgia for, for that. I mean, kids don't want to go to the lake anymore. Why would you want to go to the lake? Your, your friends aren't at the lake. So I'll just stay at home, right? But all of a sudden COVID hits and there's this huge increase in demand and the entire curve shifts. And so the quantity demanded and there, were, there was a shortage of boats out there. That's actually why I sold my two. I didn't want to sell my boats. The boat broker at the marina that I was at called me up and said, do you want to sell your boat? The, the power boat that I had was the first one. And I was like, I don't really want to sell my boat. He's like, well, I got an offer and the offer was for more than I paid for the boat. And I was like, well, maybe I do want to sell my boats. And then about a month later, he calls and says, do you want to sell, do you want to sell your sailboat? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm, you know, no. But people were looking for things to do. And if you had a job and had good credit, you could get a loan. And so boat prices at every quantity and at every price point shifted to the right because people were looking for stuff to do. Let's see if I can get this to come back now. It's warming up. Was there like a change in the supply chain for like boats? Like I know at the beginning of last year, there's kind of an issue with the supply chain Cars. Right. Cars really yeah. So cars are really, so one of the things that happened as a result of COVID, and so you can have shifts in the supply curve, right? So um, you can have shifts in the supply curve and what would cause a shift in the supply curve? If you had, for example, a leap in technology that made it easier, and this happened actually during like the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s, automation in automobile technology started um, occurring and you could produce more cars cheaper right and and faster but during covid that technology hadn't changed radically and so there were only and people again were bored and they're looking for things to do and what happened? So supply goes like this, right? Um, and you can have shifts in the supply curve. This point is called the equilibrium point. Um, there wasn't a radical shift in the cost of producing cars or in the ability to make cars faster, but people were, again, bored and they're looking for something to do. And what can you do? Well, you can go buy a car. Right? Again, this is, you know, socially distanced. And so there was a huge demand. Initially, people of car dealers thought, we're going to be shut down. They were shutting down car dealers in Oklahoma and Texas. And then they decided that that was a critical uh, merchant or a critical industry, and they reopened those. And people are, you know, if you had a job, again, if you had a job and you had good credit, and now you're not spending your money on doing what? Going out to eat, going to the movies, going to places, you know, going to sporting events. So now, literally, some of my friends were like, we've got an extra thousand dollars a month because we're eating at home. We're not eating out. We're not going out. And what they do, they wouldn't buy me a car. Right? So there was a shift in demand but there wasn't necessarily a corresponding shift in the supply curve because you, you, there's just so quickly that you can ramp up production of automobiles. It, it's not like you can just flip a switch and start producing more automobiles. It takes, it takes time for that to catch up. And there were huge disruptions in the supply chain for things like this. These became really scarce. Why did these become really scarce? 
in terms of supply. There was a huge demand. There was a shift. There was a, a major shift in the demand curve. People at every point along the curve were willing to pay more. I mean, like these, literally, I had a whole bunch of these. Not this. I had the Clorox wipes because I bought them at Sam's. And I had literally bought, right before the pandemic hit, I had bought two of the um, multi-pack Clorox wipes. So there are five in a multi-pack. And there are 70 wipes in each of those things. So I had this, and I had people, I had friends that were like, you have Clorox wipes? Uh, I will, I'm like, they would pay enormous amounts of money. I'm like, I'm not gonna need my Clorox. I'm not selling my Clorox. I may, I may need, I have Gondriac. I might need these. But there's this huge shift, but they couldn't manufacture these because what happened? There was this disruption in the supply chain and the same material that goes into making these is the material that they use to make disposable masks and there's this huge demand in both and they and they couldn't keep up with it right and it looks like i think the, i think the bulb is going out in here. So the cost of production and marketing over the long term has to cover the costs, otherwise you're going to go broke. Uh, the newness of the product and the product lifestyle uh, life cycle are going to be constraints on pricing. So when a product is new, when the Apple iPhone was first released, they got a premium on this. It was like they did advertising. People were waiting for it. They couldn't. And I had friends who are, are what we call innovators in terms of their vows, um, sort of uh, lifestyle. So did we talk about vows in here? Um, values, attitudes, lifestyles. That's a, a test that you can take that determines sort of where you are, and it's based on. Um, two, two factors. One, your access to resources, and two, your motivation. Innovators are have high access to resources, and they're motivated by all three. They're motivated by, you know, um, activity, values, um, and, and, and that kind of thing. And so I had friends who are, who are definitely innovators. They're always on the, the cusp of getting whatever is the newest thing in technology. They bought the iPhone, and I was like, in six months, that will drop in price. And at six months, it did drop in price. And I was like, All right, was that worth it? And they're like, absolutely, it was worth it to show, you know, like when it, this was new, to show all my friends that they had, you know, like for that six months, they had the latest and greatest technology on the planet um, in terms of smartphones. Um, it also, pricing constraints can, can vary based on whether or not you have a single product versus a product line. So what's a product line? If you're a clothing manufacturer and all you manufacture is vests, well, you might be more constrained than if you sell suits, three-piece suits, which have a vest, a jacket, and pants, right? or shirts, and ties, and, and all these other things. Um, the cost of changing prices and the time, historically, it took a long time. So there used to be this thing called the Sears catalog. You could buy all kinds of things in the Sears catalog. I'm from Guthrie, or I, I grew up largely in Guthrie. I was born in Northern New Mexico and lived back and forth between because my parents were divorced. But a big portion of my time was spent in Guthrie. Guthrie is one of the largest historic preserves in the nation of Victorian and Edwardian architecture. There are more properties and homes on the National Register than any other city in America per capita. One of the things that you can see in Guthrie are these homes that were called shotgun homes, and these were actually ordered. You ordered a kit from Sears and Roebuck, and they sent it to you, and you built your entire home. And the reason that they were called shotgun homes is because they were made at the turn of the 20th century, People didn't have air conditioning the way we have air conditioning now. 
And places like Oklahoma in the summer are sort of what? What's it like in Oklahoma in the summer? Is it, is it like Colorado where it's, you know, 75 and wonderful and no humidity? No. Oklahoma is hot and sticky and kind of miserable. So they built, Sears and Roebuck built these, or they sold these homes, kits, where all of the doors lined up so that you could open the front and the back door and you could get a breeze through the entire house by opening the front and the back door. And so they were called shotgun homes because they said you could stand on the front porch and shoot chickens in the backyard without doing any damage to the home, right? You could stand and you could shoot in a straight line through the house. There are a lot of these again. So the Sears and Roma catalog, and this for, for a long period of time, even when I was a kid, so obviously I didn't grow up in the early part of the 20th century. I grew up in the latter part of the 20th century. But when I was a kid, still Sears and Roebuck, the, the big book that they put out every year at Christmas time was called The Wish Book. And it was a huge catalog that they shipped out to almost every home in America. And people would go through the Sears and Roebuck catalog, and, and that was called The Wish Book. Well, if your marketing depends on sending out this book, right? How easy is that in the past to change your prices if things happen? It's not because you've sent out this catalog and you've got all these production costs and you can't just suck it back once it's out there. Now, in an age of technology where we do internet shopping, we can change prices fairly quickly, but in the past we couldn't. You put an advertisement out there you couldn't just change the price because something happened. Because there was, you know, a, uh, 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 for example, at one point in time, lumber became very scarce, particularly soft wood. Pine is a soft wood that's used for flooring and for building homes. And there was a, a beetle, I think, that, that, um, attacked pine trees and was destroying them. And so lumber became scarce. I, I believe this was like in the 1980s. And if you put out a catalog and you're selling homes like shotgun homes out of your catalog and that price is listed and all of a sudden the pine trees are dying and you're having a hard time sourcing pine, you can't just suck that back. Now in, in an age of the internet, we can do that. But still there are there are delays, even in dynamic pricing models like airlines, which use a dynamic pricing model. So if you go online, historically, the cheapest time to buy uh, airline tickets was two weeks in advance of your flight. Now, because they constantly update the prices, you can get better deals maybe at the last minute particularly if you're sort of flexible in, in, your, in your travel dates. Even then, if somebody's clicked on and they have, they've gotten that price, you can't update the price, right? I mean, there still is a temporal aspect to this. And it also depends on the type of competitive market you're in. It's easier if you are in an, uh, in an oligopoly like the airlines are to demand higher prices because there are fewer providers out there than if you are, say, a gas station or a convenience store, where if the price of uh, a soft drink gets too high, well, there's lots of other places I can go, right? There's lots of other. So 7-Eleven has really cheap uh, fountain drinks to try and get people in. Well, other, other convenience stores are competing against them. And so, although I think 7-Eleven is the cheapest, um, you can get a fountain drink. This is a, from Burger King, but um, actually it's just a couple from Burger King because it's got water in it today. But 
you can get this size of fountain drink at 7-Eleven for 75 cents, which is even cheaper than McDonald's, which is McDonald's has got the dollar menu and the one thing that's still on the dollar menu. There's not very much that's on the dollar menu anymore, but one thing that is still on the dollar menu is any size fountain drink or sweet or unsweet tea is a dollar. You can get the same thing for 75 cents at 7-Eleven. On Q, which competes against 7-Eleven and has lots of places, they're not that cheap, but they're still pretty cheap because they've got a highly competitive market for, um, for fountain drinks and things like that, candy bars. So the fundamentals of estimating your revenue, which is going to be important, total revenue minus uh, our total revenue equals price times the quantity. So your price times how much you can sell. So your average revenue is your total revenue divided by the quantity. Why would you want to look at average revenue versus the total revenue? Because um, they can cost more at certain times to produce units of uh, goods or services sold. I'll give you an example of that from my own family. Right now, the cost of us running a bed and breakfast is really, really pretty cheap. But in July, that cost will increase. And in January, our cost of producing a room rental will increase. Why is that? So right now it's really cheap for us to rent rooms, but our costs will increase in July and our costs increase in January. Why is that? Why is it really cheap right now? Absolutely. So right now, what do we have to do in terms of making a property sort of comfortable? Right. Honestly, we don't. I mean, like, we we don't have the air conditioning running today. If you're sitting in this classroom, that vent is not putting out anything. There is no air running, so it's really cheap right now. Right. So you want to, over the long haul, estimate your average revenue, which takes into account, you know, in March and April, we generally don't have to have the air conditioning running as much. And we don't have to have any heat going. And in January, we're going to have to have the heat going. And in July, we're going to have to have the air running, you know, 24-7. Marginal revenue is the change that results from producing one additional unit of the product. So we had actually, at one point in time, we had five bed and breakfasts that we owned in Gatbury. And we would, in the summertime during the week, we would restrict the amount of room rentals at some of the properties to only the weekends because we would keep those properties and the, the mechanical systems going at a, at a lower level during the week because there wasn't as much demand. And so we would funnel everybody who wanted to stay during the week into one property in order to produce. If we had to open up, if we had, and those, each property that we had um, would sleep about 12 people, right? So we had um, about six rooms at each property. We had the Redstone Country Inn, which had six rooms. We had the White Peacock, which had six rooms. And we had the Stone Line Inn, which had six rooms. If we had one additional person that wanted to stay and we couldn't get them, if we, had, if we had over six rooms, the cost of opening up one additional property for one room was pretty great. Price elasticity is the percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in the price. So if you have an increase that results an increase in price that results in a large decrease in demand, you have elastic prices. Now, your textbook historically, and I don't know if the current version says this, your current textbook says 
that gasoline, so if you have a 1% increase in price and it produces less than a 1% decrease in demand, it's inelastic. And it's unitary if it's a one for one. So if a 1% increase results in a 1% decrease in demand, you have unitary um, elasticity. Your textbook has historically said, and I don't know if the current version says this, if somebody wants to look it up, you can tell me, um, that gasoline prices and demand are inelastic. And I don't think that's true. And I'll tell you why. So the argument from the textbook authors is that people need gas. They've got to get to work. And that's inelastic. And that's somewhat true. But what happens when gas prices, for example, reached $5 a gallon? Well, I can tell you, as a boat owner, when gas prices, who, so I had this huge boat. It was a 36-foot cruiser boat has two engines, two Volvo Penta engines, and it had two gas tanks that held 100 gallons each. And I'll never forget one guy, when I first bought the boat, he's looking at boats, This, this he was on the docks, and he's, he's looking at boats, and he asked me, and this was when gas prices were like $4 a gallon, and on the lake, they were, at a lake, they're always high because there's just not that many providers, right? I mean, at $4 a gallon, you start looking around to see who's got the cheapest gas. And people have, have apps to see who's still got the cheapest gas. Gas Buddy, for example, is one that, that popped up. So this guy comes, he's walking down the dock, and he's talking to different boat owners about buying a boat. And, he, and he's talking to me at one point, and he says, well... How many miles to the gallon do you get in that boat? And I'm like, first of all, there, there are no miles to the gallon in a boat. There are gallons per minute in the boat, depending on how fast you're going, right? It's a fuel flow rate. Um, and if you, the boat I had could sleep six, it had two state rooms, and if you had two people in the main salon, you could sleep six people. It had a full head, a full galley, and even with that size of boat, you could get up on plane and pull a skier with my boat if you wanted to do that. You could get to 45 miles an hour on the lake in my boat because it was a cruiser. It wasn't, it wasn't the the, the taller, what they call a motor yacht style. It was a cruiser, so it, was, it had a very low profile and it, two huge engines, and it would get up on plane. And if you did that, you were literally, you could go through 200 gallons in less than an hour. If, if you sustained that speed on the lake, you could go, through, and so it's, it's a burn rate, right? Um, what happens when gas gets to five and six dollars a gallon on the lake? Well, people who had my boat generally, even at one and two and three dollars a gallon, don't pull speed, don't pull skiers, right? That it's not you can do it. People don't do it because it's just a waste of money. But what they do do is there's a whole lot more. So my boat was um, at one of the last when I sold it, it was at Lake Texoma. There are a group of islands at Lake Texoma. And people go to these islands and they tie up and it's it's like Redneck Yacht Club. The, it's like the country and western song, Redneck Yacht Club. And when gas was at $5 a gallon, people weren't going to the islands in boats like mine. They were staying on the dock and having dock parties. Rather than go out for a cruise, which even if you if you if you drove the boat conservatively, was probably going to be, and you went to the islands and back from my marina, which is Grand Cappy Point, to the islands and back, that was probably 
at five dollars a gallon that was probably even even going really slow out there and back was going to be a hundred and fifty dollar day in terms of gas for you when gas is two dollars a gallon or three dollars a gallon on the lake all of a sudden that hundred dollars or hundred and fifty dollars in gas is cut in half and you're looking at $75. That's a whole lot easier to absorb than 150. So there's a whole lot, when, when gas is cheap, there's a whole lot more people pulling skiers, not with my boat, but with, with ski boats. There's a whole lot more sitting that, that takes place when gas is $6 a gallon. The same thing happens, and, and, and this is why I think the textbook is wrong, the same thing happens even with cars. After you get past $3 a gallon in gas, for every increase, for every 10 cent increase in price in gasoline, the number of automobile deaths diminishes significantly. And there's two factors that, that affect that. What are those two factors? One, people drive slower. You do not gun the, the car when you're getting on the interstate so that you can get ahead. So you've got on, on the interstate as you're getting on, there's the fast lane, which is the left, and there's the slow lane, which is the right. And in normal places, not in Oklahoma, but in normal places, you always enter the interstate in the right-hand lane, right? In Oklahoma, we have lots of places where you, and I can give you an example of this, at the I-44 and uh, Classen Junction, if you are entering I-44 off of Classen Boulevard, you enter into the left lane, which makes no sense because that's the fast lane. Right. In other places, they don't do that. You always enter into the slow lane. As you're entering onto an interstate, you are required. If you are if you are the traffic that's that's merging into the interstate, you have the yield sign, and you are required to yield. Now, people generally don't. What do they do? Well, if gas prices are cheap. They'll gun the car, they'll floorboard the car to get ahead of somebody so that they don't have to slow down. That, that can be very dangerous, right? If gas prices are at $5 a gallon, people don't do that. They yield. Because they, they don't want to get use that gas. What else do people not do when gas prices are $5 a gallon? Well, you start planning, yes, the, the textbook authors are correct, because one of the things that they used to say in, in previous editions was people have to go to work. Well, that's true, but you start planning things more when gas prices are $5 a gallon, if you have a gas guzzling car. Like, you don't go home and then go back out to the grocery store. You start really, people start planning very carefully. It's like, yeah, I gotta go, I gotta go to work today. But you know, I start looking in my refrigerator the night before and planning what it is that I'm gonna need from the grocery store so that I can get it on my way home. And you stop going on long road trips with the family in the gas guzzling you know, recreational vehicle, right? Um, so estimating revenue, um, elasticity and price is important. Arriving at the vital price. You can have demand-oriented pricing, skimming. That's the iPhone. They, they started out with a huge charge, uh, a huge premium when it was first introduced to skim. It comes from skimming. Um, this is from, from farming. If you are a dairy farmer, uh, you skim the cream off of the top, right? So you're skimming um, used by innovators. 
Penetration pricing is the exact opposite of that. This is where you try and get demand, you try and build demand by offering an initial low price to get people interested in the product. This happens a lot with consumer packaged goods. In order to get on the shelf, they will offer something at a low price to get people interested in buying it and addicted to it. Um, in Oklahoma, there's lots of made in Oklahoma goods. One of the ones, when they first got into Walmart, they offered a discount and they offered it really cheaply. It was Head Country Barbecue in order to get into and build demand. There's lots of barbecue sauces out there. Every state seems to have their favorite barbecue recipes. I generally tend to think that Oklahoma's barbecue is some of the best. And I generally tend to think that Head Country is some of the best barbecue sauce that you can buy. But there's a lot of there's a lot of competition out there. It's not like an iPhone, right? I mean, sort of there are two types of varieties of barbecue. And what are the two types of varieties of barbecue sauce that you get? It's it's based on the proportion of two ingredients in the barbecue sauce. So what what is uh, what is sort of the traditional sort of barbecue dichotomy? Isn't it either like vinegary or super sweet? Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. It's either vinegary, it's either it's either sour or sweet. Do you like really sweet barbecue? Now they've started to add a third component to that, which is heat. Do you want, you know, like sort of fiery hot barbecue? Barbecue sauces are, there's, there's, you know, lots of barbecue sauces out there. And so it, it's hard to set yourself apart. And so they used a penetration pricing as opposed to the iPhone. When the iPhone was released, this was, smartphones were a relatively new device. Most cell phones at the time didn't have all of the features that, you know, like people, when the iPhone was released, still had phones that were largely just used for phones. I know this is hard for you all to, to think about because you've always had this device, you've always had it attached to your hand, and you've always been able to text. My first mobile phones, you couldn't text. They were just to call on. I don't even know why they bother calling them cell phones anymore because 90% of what you do with this device is not talking to anybody on it. Your generation is horribly afraid of, of actually talking. It's one of the reasons I tell students that you can text me, like, because I know you're not going to call. But you will text. You like to text. It should be called a texting device rather than, you know, a texting device that has, or an entertainment device that has a calling feature at this point is what it should be. So prestige pricing is another pricing model. Um, and my example here is Tag Cure. I have a Tag Cure. Um, I like watches. I like jewelry. Uh, for those of you that are in the live class, you can see that. I've got lots of big, chunky gold jewelry on. I have, you know, my, my gold nugget bracelet, my gold nugget cufflinks. Um, I had a tag here. Generally speaking, the, the demand curve is, is an inverse curve, is, is a negative relationship, right? The higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded at all points along, uh, along the curve. But Tag Cure wanted to compete. They don't want to compete with, with Timex. Tag Cure wants to compete with Rolex. The average price of a Tag Cure at one point in time was $500. They increased their price to the average price being $1,000, and the demand went up. Why? Because at $1,000, the average, okay, so the Rolex prices, a new Rolex, I think the cheapest you can get into a new Rolex today, if you went to VC Clark 
is the, the, the lowest, the base model of Rolex, I think it's still the Air King, um, which is a very basic watch. It's stainless steel, it has a fairly plain face. So my Rolex has, it, this is what's called a date just, which means it's got a date feature on it. Um, that's more expensive and mine is a two-tone. So the basic model of Rolex, which is called the Air King, I think that's still the, the base model, has no date feature. It's all stainless steel. It does have the Oyster Perpetual, um, the Oyster Perpetual. It's an Oyster case with a perpetual movement. Rolex was one of the first to, to develop the perpetual, which is my watch winds itself by movement. Right? I don't have to wind the width of It's a mechanical watch. It doesn't have a battery. And I don't have to wind it every day. It, it, it winds itself based on the movement of my wrist. So that's the base model of Rolex. Stainless steel. I think it's got a blue face. Um, $5,000 today. That, that, that The last time I checked, which was a year ago, um, on these watches, it was it was five grand for the base model of Rolex. Tag here increases their base model of tag to one thousand dollars. One thousand dollars is closer to five thousand. Now they're competing more with Rolex. There was a people perceived it as being more prestigious, and demand went up. It's a prestige pricing. Rolex goes up every single year. Price lining assumes that demand is inelastic between price points. And you'll see this in uh, department stores. So they're assuming that there's like people are willing to pay $35, $45, $55 for a pair of slats. But in between those points, it's inelastic. Right? Now there may not be in terms of quality that much difference, but you, you price things along those price points, assuming that in between it's inelastic. If this is the price people have in their mind to pay for this stuff. So they do things like have discount stores or outlet malls where they it's basically the same good. If you go and buy um, Lucky Jeans at the outlet mall here in Oklahoma City, it's basically the same jean that they're going to sell in, in Penn Square Mall, um, but they have you know different price points because people are price sensitive. But there's inelasticity between those price points. Odd even pricing that works where you psychologically use and people get used to it, so it doesn't always work. Where you you set the price at fifty nine ninety nine because people. It's less than sixty dollars, right? They're, they're not focusing on it's basically sixty bucks, but they're focusing on the fact that it's less than something. Targeting it's where you estimate what consumers were willing to pay, and then you back into that price. You say, I think this is what people are willing to pay, and you do this through market research or just through you know sort of guesstimating um, through a swag, which is a scientific wild ass guess. Um, this is what people are willing to pay, and then you back into that price. Bundling has become very popular, so um, you bundle your home. Some people still have, have home phones because they've got a bundle with Cox, and it's cheaper if you get home, internet, and cable with Cox than if you just get one of those three, right? So that's bundle pricing. And then yield management, this is dynamic pricing airline tickets, where they they price based on sort of um, the demand at the, at the moment. You can have cost-oriented pricing. So standard markups, this is what supermarkets use. Um, Homeland stores, uh, Home, Homeland Corporation now has a, um, a brand, a sub-brand of their stores called uh, Cost Plus or something like that, and Cash Savers, that's what it's called, they call it Cash Savers, where it's, they tell you the price is this plus we had 10% of the register. That's the standard, you know, that's the standard. So it's like 
the price is what it costs us plus 10 percent profit oriented where you target your profit um, is a profit oriented uh, way of pricing uh, targeted return on investment lots of american businesses use this it's usually a short-term strategy you, I've, I've got to make my bills i've got to have this roi a targeted return on sales you can also depending on the market have com uh, competition oriented pricing which is sort of like what's customary so what is customary pricing well customary pricing you know is like coke in a, in a, in a soda machine what's the sort of customary price for a 20 ounce bottle of coca-cola in a vending machine it's a dollar fifty currently right and that's generally what uh, a 20 ounce coke costs or maybe it may have gone up to two dollars that's sort of the customary price you get beyond that and people are they're not going to buy it right it's just what's customary it's what i'm used to paying two bucks for a coke or whatever in a vending machine that's that's what's customary at um above or below pricing um loss leader pricing again this is used by a lot of uh, uh consumer packaged goods stores um they price something really cheap to get people into the store like milk historically has been a loss leader and then they uh assume that you're going to buy other stuff in, in the store Any questions about price? All right. Well, next week you will have the week to do your exam, so we won't meet. I know that that's probably going to be heartbreaking to you that you uh, don't have to get up at the crack of dawn, although it's not quite the crack of dawn anymore since the days are getting longer. Um, at the crack of dawn and be here or, or log on. Um, and if you feel cheated by that, you just give me a call and I'll be happy to talk to you about all kinds of marketing things. You know, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about any topic you want in marketing. So I will see you um, after next week. Have a good, have a good week, and um, the exam will be ready on Tuesday or before.